Okay, recording is in progress. All right. Uh, welcome to Agile Adventures. How you doing, Brian? Good. It's a good day. It's a good air quality in California, which is a rarity. Uh, do you have asthma? Yes. Asthma and, uh, and the pollution here just kills me. Uh, have you ever been to Beit Shemesh? Uh, no, no, I haven't. You should come. Is it better there? No, terrible. But <laughs> but but there's a place in in Israel called uh, what's it called? It's called um, Arad, and it's like actually like people with asthma and allergies. Like uh, there's like a large colony of people who like moved there because right. it's so dry and not uh, like. I don't even think they're all Jewish. Like, I think like, it's just like very good for, and then my, my, my uncle moved to Sedona because of allergies. Well, I, I, I'd rather go to Israel than Sedona. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He keeps inviting me over to visit and I'm like, when will I ever go to, to Sedona? Like, never, never. Like, there's, there's no chance I'm ever gonna visit you. <laughs> you made your choice by moving to Sedona. <laughs> uh, although I hear it's beautiful, and by that I mean I'm never going, so I have to rely on. I have, so I have to rely on what people tell me. Yeah, so, anyways, <laughs> yes, yes, everyone's beautiful and everyone's special. Uh, yes, uh, participation trophies. Uh, okay, so uh, I was thinking today perhaps we talk about the the history of, of agile and the vast wasteland that was that 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 the earth was before agile was invented you know the found the great founding fathers of, of agile the holy priests of agile and uh all that stuff that you know like you know set, setting the stage for why we might want to give agile a spin uh you know so i figure we'll you know uh, so I guess let's start off with, with who invented Agile and why did they do it? All right, so uh, let's start with the why before the who. So the okay. why, if you go back to the, uh, the 1990s, and that's actually where my career started is in the 90s. Every Mine project too. that I, what's that? You Mine, too. Mine too, yes. Yeah, there you go. First it was grade a great time. The first grade was like serious, uh, serious, uh, serious business. And so now you're, now you're just pointing out how old I am, right? <laughs> um, so in the 90s, like every project I would join had a different methodology. And the methodology, um, you know, almost by definition of what a methodology is, had different processes, different roles, different notations. Right, so you had to learn the notation they were using, um, different um, diagrams they used to analyze things. And so in every project, because it was a different one, it would take like three months before the team got into a rhythm because most of them didn't know the methodology that was being So you're used. saying nothing at all has changed since the 1990s? I don't know, man. Lots, lots of change, right? <laughs> um, the, uh, so... With that, with that different not notation and methodology, a bunch of people in the industry got together and they said, this is ridiculous. You know, we're losing productivity. Why don't we actually meet and decide on one methodology or maybe even create, you know, take the best parts of different methodologies, agree to it. And then when we get on different projects, we'll be efficient. We'll just decide on the best one. Now at the time, the predominant methodologies, like the most predominant one, was like the rational unified process. The what? The rational unified process. Ah, the rational unified process. Yes, it was a. Uh, Brings a tear to my eye. <laughs> it was supposed to be all inclusive, like, you know, uh, a, a tool to be used for every situation. It had a hundred and 69 artifacts that you could produce 
and I think a, like 109 processes that you could go through. And the thought behind it was that they're gonna include all this stuff and depending upon your situation, you would actually Just go shopping out the stuff you didn't need. Huh. Wait, so it, basically they wrote your program like, but they just over engineered one huge monster program and you took out the stuff you didn't need? Well, yeah, basically from a, you know, from a process perspective, that's what it was. Like they, they gave you all this information and you would, you know, they had a, a role specifically called a rational engineer or a process engineer. And that role was responsible for tailoring the process. So they would analyze your situation and say, here's the stuff you don't need. Here's the stuff you do need. Hmm. Right. But the problem is that um, when you actually said, here's the stuff you don't need and try to take it out, no one would listen. Because if something went wrong, I didn't want it to be my fault and someone saying it's your fault because you didn't do this thing. So they would do it to CYA. Mm. It calls for a whole bunch of unnecessary work. So, so anyway, that, that there was a movement against that type of development. So a, bu a bunch of the guys who had done different methodologies got together. Um, and it was funny that they, they decided to meet together and a lodge in Snowbird, Utah, a ski, ski resort, right? Yes. And they said, we're going to get together. Um, we're going to decide on one methodology. And guess what happened? They just spent this weekend skiing. Yeah, they're, they're drinking. They all thought their methodology was the best. And so they couldn't agree on what methodology to use. <laughs> So was there like, what they could agree on. Were there fist fights? <laughs> I, I, I wasn't there, but I heard there, were, there was lots of drinking and there were, there were some unkind words exchanged. <laughs> uh -huh. Sounds, sound, yeah. Okay. We've all been there, you know. Yeah. Alcohol was a so, factor, uh, right? Then, uh, so, they, uh, so they got to, alcohol was a factor. <laughs> But, but they couldn't agree on the methodology. The only thing they could agree on were a bunch of guiding principles and values that should be used to create the methodology. And so the guiding values and principles that they did agree to, that became the agile. Late. Okay, so I'm like we're getting some instability here. One second. Sorry, that's it's probably my fault. Um. Okay. It's it's. She can't. See it. Okay. So uh, I see. I'm gonna move upstairs because I. I'm in, I'm in the corner of the house with the uh, worst Wi-Fi. Best lighting, but the worst Wi-Fi. So can you hear me better now? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you now. A little bit more stable? Yes. Right. So I pulled up in front, on the screen. I pulled up the Agile Manifesto. Uh-huh. And so those were the, those were you the can guys. see in the Agile Manifesto. You got it. Oh. Except for one important guy. <laughs> There's a guy by the name of Chet Hendrickson, who actually was the project manager lead for the first Agile project. Um, he's one of the creators of extreme programming. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had a prior engagement and couldn't make it out. Hmm. But he's the first signatory. Oh, cool. So you're saying Agile started off with failure. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> and that's the basis of everything. 
it sounds strange, but the basis of agile is you know, you're only going to use agile if you're in a situation in which you don't know all the requirements and what's necessary. And I don't know exactly what the solution should be. So I, I got to experiment. I got to try some stuff out and see if it works. So it, it's actually the application of the scientific method. I'm going to try something out, see if it works. If it works, I do more of it. If it doesn't work, I try something else. Right? That's how all science happens. Yes. One hates to draw parallels, but you know, there's another document that was had a bunch of dudes hang out in a room and get totally plastered that seems to do it pretty well, you know. <laughs> the US Constitution was this kind of that. No, it weren't. Were they totally plastered when they made the constitution? Is that, I, I, or is that just some like thing I heard? I, I've heard the same thing. Totally plastered. Yeah. Couldn't agree to yeah. a lot of stuff. Made a lot of compromises. That's good. Yeah, yeah. So, uh -huh. so you say generally speaking, is that is that is that uh, codified and agile to like you know when you're starting to to work out your thing to like you know take a little get a little highball, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I I think that's just the uh, the way of the world, it's the way of business. So the, the, that goes without saying. You don't really need to put that in the uh, in the manifesto because we all right. know that everyone is drinking. We we all know, right? Okay, all right. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so okay, so, so I see. So here's the thing that people don't. Know. Yeah. What people don't know is that the agile approach, and I'm going to back up here to the uh, front page here. The, what is the, the agile that approach. Background? I know it's kind of ugly, isn't it? <laughs> it it's it's actually like you guys, you guys are not that group. Good. They, I, know, they, I know you guys think you're really cool, but like you guys is there, they really have a. They may have had some misconception. They may, it's good that they have good body images and stuff, but you know, like this is like not what I want to. It's not what I want to stare <laughs> at while I'm trying to read. <laughs> okay. Anyways, go on. <laughs> well, so uh, the what people don't know, and it's kind of touched on what you brought out earlier. If you read the preamble, so it's the first part of the Agile Manifesto. It tells yes. you the nature of everything agile and it says we are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it through this we have come to value and then it lists out the values but the okay. point I'm gonna, the thing i'm going to bring out is that the first sentence we are uncovering better ways of developing software so what agile is all about is the understanding that your situation is going to be different from other people because you're doing something that's probably new. Mm -hmm. And there are some techniques that have worked in the past, but there's new techniques that are going to be developed every day. And, and the thought process is that because every situation is different and new techniques are coming out, the goal of the team that's doing the work is to uncover the processes and techniques that work best for them. So no one can give you, here's the best agile technique and the best way to do everything. You should be figuring it out yourself through experimentation. No one knows cool. this. They don't know it because consultants like- Sell it as a panacea. It's, it's, it's hard for you to sell it. <laughs> yes. We, we look good if we're, you pay us more if we let the experts, right? So I'm, I come in with, hey, here's the way you should do it. I've done this for years, and here's the best way. Yes, but, yes, uh -huh. but that's... So we sell you a process. Okay. <laughs> yes, the process is not, yeah, so it says here, oh, this is like the Zen of Python, kind of, but for uh, but it's the something of Agile. So... Is it a Zen, is it the Zen it. of Agile? I mean, you know, we could, 
we could we could we could overlook Zen Buddhism's Zen Buddhism's violent and gruesome past, and you know, say it's the Zen of. Okay, so it says individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, respond to change over following a plan. That is, while there are thing, while there is a value, while there is value in the items on the right, we value on the item. Okay, like yes. That seems, it seems they just thought the top was too short. <laughs> <laughs> well, basically what they're, what it all boils down to, um, 60s, 70s, there was a lot of work that was done on uh, goal setting theory by, uh, uh, by Latham and uh, Edwin Locke. Mm -hmm. And so they did a whole bunch of experiments and studies. And what they found out is that when people set goals and the, the tougher those goals are, the better the performance is of the people doing it. Mm -hmm. Additionally, what they found out is that when you do work in teams, Worse. The performance that comes out is more dependent on the interactions of the people in the team than it is on the activities that people planned out in advance. And so most of the, the work in, that comes from Agile is, has been based in this goal setting theory. But that's not so great, you're saying. The goal setting, well, no, oh, it, oh, actually, oh, no, no, the goal setting theory is great, but the goal right. setting per se is not good. The interaction is more important than the actual goal set. Well, in the past, so before Agile came out, um, the theory that people went by or the underlying assumption was that I could develop a set of activities that you could follow and come out with the best result. So it was heavily focused on process as the panacea to make things efficient. And mm -hmm. when you think about what software is about, um, software is really about problem solving. And you're gonna come up with different problems and although we like to, uh, people like to try to make the analogy between software and construction, and they try to set up here the basic activities you should do every time, like you do in a construction project, software is different because when I'm going to change something. Yeah, I have no idea what, 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 what's well, involved in construction. <laughs> no clue, but yeah, sure. I, I imagine that it's, it's, you know, big tools. You don't want to change too much. You want to be too creative with the hacks with you know the circular saw, you know. Well, I think what we run into in construction, if I'm building a, a space shuttle, right? Mm -hmm. The cost of changing something is so big, and the danger of changing something, um that it isn't carefully thought through is so expensive that you really want to plan things out very well, right? Because it's expensive and dangerous, right? We, you know, we went years with the space shuttles being successful and then we had a string of space shuttles that blew up because people didn't actually handle the change as well. But software is fundamentally different, right? To change a line of code, I can change it I can experiment and test it um, and know that the consequences were really low for that change. Now I know it works and I can put it into production. So like- Oh, that space thing, like, you know, I think like, didn't they have like a bunch of them where like, there's some like faulty code where like they didn't convert the Celsius back to Fahrenheit. 
the Fahrenheit back to Celsius or something and like stuff overheated and blew up. You got it. Uh huh. And you know, and again, these these are things that you know, if you you don't test one thing, it can have these dire consequences. Right. Um, but uh again, in software development, change is relatively inexpensive. And because change is relatively inexpensive, we want to create an environment where changes are welcome. So in, in construction, because change is expensive, we don't want to change anything. Because change is dangerous, we want you to figure everything out in advance and never change anything. In fact, the early days of project management, they used to, I received, you know, I got my, pro, my PMP, like, 25 years ago, and when I was practicing, I remember achieving a, a, a change award. And the award was because I was able to manage a project and make sure there were no changes on the project. <laughs> we used to get rewarded for that, right? Cool. Where, you know, hey, I mean, as long as it's a monetary reward, you know. Well, you contrast that to Agile, because the environment changes, customer needs may change, and you know what? You never figure out what all the customer needs are in the beginning anyway. We mm -hmm. want an environment that really accommodates and welcomes changes. And that's like the basis, the underlying assumption um, for Agile is that you don't know everything up front and you can't know everything up front. And because of that, don't, need, don't even try. Go ahead and just make it easy that when you get new information, you can actually change um, your project to develop and incorporate that information in the most effective manner. Huge difference in the underlying principles. What do you think? So far, that's that's uh... so just to just to to recap so. It used to be they had some. So I'm a little. So this this thing that was before it was like, it was like a basically like a what we would call nowadays a framework. You no, know? like it was like a huge monolith framework or something, uh, and yeah. that people that people used to like. Okay, and they were trying to make the next huge monolith. It was a, it was a and then they thought they were going to make the next monolith framework, and then with all the inebriation, they realized that they could never make the next monolith th th framework because the entire idea of making a monolith framework was a bad idea. Correct. Okay. Sounds and a little fact, like sour grapes when you put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll go a step further. It's, it's even more interesting. In the past, the underlying theory was that you had people and I don't know if you ever heard of McGregor's theory, theory X and theory Y, where theory X is that people I are like it lazy. already. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, pe people y. are lazy. You can't trust them. And so you need someone to oversee them, right? And so the old theories of how you manage projects is that you had to have a project manager. I love that it's a McGregor. I just, I, 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 I feel like I know him. I know this man. <laughs> When, You're when lazy. Why, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, why was that? Hey, people are good and responsible, and people want to do the right thing. And if, if you give them an environment where they can thrive, they'll actually just do the right thing. And so that was the big change. The traditional project management, you had a project manager who was in charge, and they told everybody what to do. Mm. A lot of false dichotomies here, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. People yeah. are either either lazy and lazy and evil, or you know, virtuous and and you know, yeah, uh -huh. angelic. Okay. Right? Yes. <laughs> so theory X and the, Y. And then yeah, there's the, a theory the Z, which is like, why you, which is that you just. By the way, what was the budget on making these theories? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there was a you know. Another uh, snow uh, or ski resort 
Well, there was lots of inebriation and they were coming up with these theories, right? This was all, <laughs> this was, this was all a, a, an elaborate ploy by the, by the liquor lobby. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the under, so the underlying theory in Agile is that, and, and this part is, it's is true, like software developers are not factory workers. And we, we act as though the output of a developer is code. But really, the main output of a developer is really a design, which is a decision. You can choose one design over another, right? But the main output is the decision on what the best design is and what to implement. And because of that, they, you know, you're working with knowledge workers you know, who make decisions as an output. And you can't set up, here's the right set of activities, the right things to do. Your activities and actions are gonna differ based on the decisions that you make. Hmm. And so you need, if that's your output, then you can't focus as much on processes which again, by definition, a process is a series of related activities that transform inputs into outputs. If, if, if you're managing a bunch of people that are knowledge workers that make decisions, then I shouldn't focus so much on trying to standardize the activities. Okay, you can, that's kind of the activity is gonna switch every yeah. time you switch a decision. Yeah, you can't also make decisions. Like if you make every, if, if yeah. you're hiring people to make decisions, and then you make all the decisions in advance, then you really don't need to hire them, right? That's that's right. Like, why, why do I need them? Why, why can't I just write this stuff down? <laughs> Automate it. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. You should have been taking notes when you're making all these decisions. Uh, okay. So, okay. So, but, um, I feel there's a lot here about processes, and, like individuals' interactions over processes and tools. This is saying. Yeah, we know we came here to make the God framework, but uh, we decided that's not so important. That's the tools, right? And the processes are what? Right. Yeah, what again, are, the old way, the old methodologies were very heavy on um, processes that focus on here, the activities you should do. And this is saying, you know what? If you're making decisions, the people are making decisions, we've got to put more weight on helping those people make decisions, making sure they can communicate well to get the information they need to make the right decisions versus mm -hmm. just following a bunch of activities, right? And it's not that those activities aren't important, but really given, you know, we just discussed before this podcast, your knowledge of Python and how you can make better designs than a lot of developers we know in Python it is better for me to give you the information to make the decision than try to manage the activities that you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. So after that first thing you're saying. Okay. And then working software over comprehensive documentation. So I guess comprehensive documentation is like they would hand these, what do you call them? PMPs? Yeah, they used to have a, what's called a PRD, a product requirements document that says, here's, here's where everything's going to be built. And they it used to be, at, they had what they're called stage gates. So they say, look, in the end of the project, we're going to do all the planning. And how do we know we finished the planning phase? Well, we got this beautiful project plan that we're going to follow. And next phase is going to be requirements gathering. And how do we know we got all the requirements? Well, we got this beautiful requirement document that comes out of it. All right, and how do we if we, if we do say so high. ourselves, right? <laughs> exactly. Well, actually, what, I'm glad that you chuckled at it because the flaw in this is how do you know that the document that had the requirements is complete? It's beautiful. Right? <laughs> like, you know, it's, I can change the typeface for some really bad requirements, right? <laughs> I could, I, yeah, I, I, I feel like, I feel like we both could like 
make requirements that are really stupid sound really important if we like you know spend put our heads to it like you know absolutely and a lot of people actually do <laughs> yes yes <laughs> i've met and, a few and yes. so but what this one is saying is that hey if you're trying to develop software the best way for you to judge progress isn't in documentation it's in how much software you developed if you had to develop a, a hundred features don't tell me you're halfway done because you got a whole bunch of documents created i believe you're halfway done when 50 of those features actually work <laughs> and i can actually use it then i think you're halfway done right uh -huh. yeah so, that's that's the whole that's the whole oh the last half always takes you know four, four to five times as long as the first half <laughs> my, my wife always jokes about it projects and she's like you know in the beginning every it project they quote six to nine months and she's she's always said did you say six to nine months or did you say 69 months because that's usually what it takes <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, okay, I guess I guess uh, I've seen places where there, but probably it should take six to nine months. It's just if, you know, if you're doing it right, because and the, there's another theory in agile, um, which is if you look at most software, and I was talking to someone about this yesterday. Um, the person I was talking to uh, just got their MBA. Um, they were doing they do lots of statistical analysis. And they use Excel a lot. And I'm, so I'm asking them, like, what percentage of the functionality of Excel do you actually use? And they're like, five, maybe 10%. And I'm like, you know what? Everyone I talk to has the exact same answer. Why'd they develop the other 90%? Right? Oh, because it's really cool. Uh, <laughs> Lambda, Lambda, now they have Lambda, that's like really cool. <laughs> I'm not saying that it's useful. I'm not saying like like 99 percent of people will useful will not use it, but it's like really <laughs> like the fact that that Excel is now Turing complete, it's mind blowing, man. It, see, here's the thing: it's like if you want to actually produce things faster and cheaper, then better for you to talk to the customer, see what part is actually valuable, do that part first. And when you start noticing the return on investment is going down, maybe you stop building that thing and put your money somewhere else. Wait, so you're saying Excel is not like, cause like, I don't know, like, I feel like are, are, are all the people using the same 5% or like, I feel like Excel might be like just a case where like every business, like sort of like, like, some of them by default just like use it for their all their business logic and like it could be that like yeah they're all using different five percents of this mega program that's like yeah i don't know anecdotally i found that people are using the same functions with the exception oh, okay. of you know if you go to a um <clears throat> excuse me like a financial services firm yeah then they're using a little bit more intricate calculations. Um, mm -hmm. And they they may use 25% instead of the basic 10 that everyone else uses. Well, now that now, now that they have Lambda, I don't use anything but Lambda. Cause like, why should I? Cause I could use Lambda. That's <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, why, should, why should I have to go look through how they implement it when I could just implement it myself? <laughs> But the other thing, so I mean, but this kind of gets to that, the third value here, customer collaboration over contract negotiation. So it used to be, we get a requirement document and you had to implement this stuff, all right? And again, your project managers were trying to eliminate changes. So what they do is they say, tell me everything you want, but tell me right now, because we're gonna institute change control and at that point later on, I'm gonna punish you every time you try to make a change. We're gonna go through this long process. We're gonna review it and changes won't be easy. 
And so what everyone does in that environment is it's like, oh, if I got to hurry up and give all the stuff I may want now, I'm going to tell you everything I could possibly want, including the kitchen I wanted sink. To I wanted to water my plants also. <laughs> That's right. And, you know, when you think about it, when I'm trying to build that, uh, that application to uh, make cars go faster and um, watering their plants is probably not one of the most important requirements for it. But I put it in the contract, so now you got to do it, right? And the return on investment for it is probably not nice. <laughs> but it's in the yeah. contract. So but Agile was like, hey, let's, let's get close to the customers, figure out what's best for them, and just implement the stuff that they really care about and the stuff that's not so important. Don't implement it. It's probably a waste of mind, uh, a time and, and effort and money. Yeah, it's interesting though, because like I, every time I like I hear that, I'm just like, yeah, your customer doesn't want to talk to you after you. He wants you. To, he wants you to send you off on your way, and like have you do it. Like every time you call him, you're like annoying him sometimes. Well, I find the opposite. I find that customers that are really gonna use your software, they wanna tell you exactly how it should be developed and how, to, how they're gonna use it, right? And mm -hmm. when if you show me a customer who doesn't wanna be bothered with you, I'll show you a team that ignores what the customer wants. So, you know, if, if you talk to them and ask for their advice and they tell you to, to do X and then you never do it, <laughs> then it's like, yeah, they don't want to talk to you because it's a waste of time. <laughs> uh -huh. But again, the, the ones okay. who are already going to use it, but they want it done their way. I hear that. Uh -huh. Well, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to argue that. Yeah. Okay, fine. Good. Um, okay. So and then responding to change or following a plan that we've covered. Okay. So then what happened? And so, also, so, yeah, go on. So, uh, the, so an agile start becoming popular because it was like a revolution. Developers hated the tyranny of the project manager. Right. Uh -huh. And actually, you no, know, I talked to a, you know, sometimes the developers will talk to a customer. The customer said they want X. Project manager is like, hey, we agreed to do Y. And the developers have been mad. Like, why we do all this work to do X and they're never going to use it? And so the, it became a kind of a ground swell movement that Agile was used and things became really efficient. And so developers really liked it. Yes. Um, and the we really came into play, um, um, really came out of here and like out of Silicon Valley. There was a a, a company, um, Sammy Sega, who uh, they were making video games, and they had these tight deadlines, and they started using Agile, and they came out and with some superb games in a short amount of time. And everyone loved it. And when they had this huge success, more and more people wanted to use Agile as a result. So Sonic the Hedgehog is what caused us all to do <laughs> Agile. <laughs> well, what happened is that other uh, gaming companies, they were still stuck in the, in the old way where they had a, a date they had to hit stuff by. And it was like, hey, just work harder, spend, stay up late and work weekends and but meet that date. Whereas in Agile, you're producing the highest quality features. So I could actually produce a game that doesn't actually have all the everything finished before I release it. Because in, when I first released the game, none of the none of the people now most of the games have storylines now. And when I first release it, nobody needs to know the end of the storyline. Usually it takes gamers, you know, like weeks, months to conquer a game. So I don't need to have that endpoint finish 
on day one. I can iterate through and build that part later. There's always right? some pimply teenager who's going to like spend the next like three weeks with no sleep and, you know, it's downing no red bathing. bulls. Is, yeah. Well, he wouldn't have done that anyways. <laughs> you know, let's, <laughs> let's not be overly generous here. <laughs> But yeah, that, that's what we want is like, you know, this environment where you're putting out the highest use, most useful thing first, and you can keep iterating through and add on incrementally additional pieces that will make it more complete. Uh-huh. Now, now there's all, there's all these kind of like wacky and like acronym implementations of, of agile, like scrum and Kanban and like all those other things. Who came up, who thought that was a good idea? <laughs> so I, I talked about the, uh, like some of the people down here are the signatories, like Ron Jeffries, he was a, a big one for extreme programming, but Ken Schraber and Jeff Sutton were the best marketers and they came out with Scrum. And Scrum is right now one of the most popular agile um, approaches. You think it's overrated? No, it's not that it's overrated. I think all of them it's work. It's terrible. <laughs> no, I, I, I like Scrum. Like we implemented oh, okay. Scrum, right? I, okay. So I like it. But I mean, a lot of it is it's popular because of marketing, right? Um, well, I mean, the choice of name, they weren't the, you know, they had, they didn't really, you know, seems like something you, 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 you know, scrape off your bathtub, you know. <laughs> Ooh, you're looking kind of scrummy today. Are you okay? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, it's, you know, you said, these, these are the best guys of marketing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So scrum, um, I, again, I love scrum. Scrum is based on problem solving. It's a problem solving method. And the theory behind it, um, which no one knows this, by the way, even though Scrum is like readily available and everyone can read well, about I it. I mean, like everyone like, you know, just says that, like, I mean, this is, this is my critique of Agile, to be honest with you, is like, it's, to it, it's it's in a certain sense it's like a little bit overly um like it's like those things that everyone likes to say that like oh like we're doing x y and z like it's just it's like and the concepts behind it are too abstract for apparently people who actually develop software <laughs> well, so it's because the people that use it and talk about it really don't know what it is yeah you know but yeah i'm saying so this is this is this is this is i mean it could be it's a critique of the marketing more than the actual product but i was saying right. like yeah the the fact meaning the fact that everybody uses scrum to me is meaningless because everyone i've met, met say, say they use agile and they all do the same stupid like video really, like when you told me like yeah it used to be that like everyone had their own methodology and like it took three months to figure out what anyone was actually trying to say. Like, I was like, yeah, okay. Like that's, that's yeah, that never happens anymore. <laughs> it, 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 so here's what's interesting, right? So I'm in the scrum guy, I'm explaining it on the screen and they have a definition for scrum, which most people don't know what scrum is, right? And it says scrum is a lightweight framework that helps people, teams, organizations generate value through adaptive solutions for complex problem. Yeah, like that was never, no one ever was ever gonna get what that meant. <laughs> yeah, it's, that means that Scrum is for problem solving, right? Like yeah, all yeah, the coders it, think like that before, Scrum is like a coding method or something for them. It's like, no, it's, this is a problem solving man, uh, method for management, not for developers, <laughs> right? Yeah. And the theory behind Scrum, is that you develop a goal that you're trying to reach. Again, going back to Latham's theory about goal setting theory, mm -hmm. I have a goal, a, a desired end state that I want to achieve. And I have a current state of where I'm at. 
And I'm basically doing a gap analysis. And what I'm doing is I'm saying, all right, I want to make sure we're on the right track because I don't really know how to solve this gap. So figure out what piece you can do in the time box and then do that piece. And let's see if you've made the progress that you thought you make. If you made the progress that you thought you make, then your development method is probably fairly good. But if you haven't made the progress that you thought you made, then the way you're developing probably isn't that great. And you should change the way you're developing. <laughs> Do something different. Yeah, I'm reading this. It's, it's all a bunch of buzzwords, right? Scrum is founded on empiricism and lean thinking. Okay. Empiricism, to what? Like, you know, like, uh, like uh you know like what are we like are we are we reading hume now like and now and 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 lean thinking like meaning like like not overthinking things like okay well actually what you're saying you know you're saying it jokingly but you're not far off right we are reading hume and yeah, <laughs> i mean I've, I've read hume but i mean like they're like, oh yeah, well, of course, founded on theory, on, on empiricism, lean thinking. Well, okay, well, why didn't you say so? <laughs> yeah, the, the theory behind this is that, um, again, because I can't, I'm doing something that hasn't been done before. I can't plan out everything and know that it's gonna have the desired outcome. So only thing I could do is do a piece of it and then look to see, does it have the desired outcome? And ad adapt yes. accordingly. Yes. And lean thinking, lean is basically saying, don't do stuff that's wasteful, right? So if, if you're doing stuff and you find out that it's not giving you the outcome that you want, just stop doing it, right? Ooh. Now, here's the- like, here's if, only, if only people did that in real life. <laughs> So in, in lean, there are eight different types of ways. And we believe in agile that there's one type of ways out of the eight different types that's more evil than the others. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What's the eight? Is this like an eightfold path? What, what do you mean there's eight types of ways? Yeah, there's eight different types of ways. So I'm going to actually, uh, I'm, I'm going to Google lean types of types of ways. And it makes an acronym. I'm going to put down downtime because it makes this handy dandy acronym called down, downtime, right? You see that Google, the autom apparently there are much more people Googling lean types of fish. <laughs> so here are the eight different types of ways, right? You got defects. And, and defects are when you produce stuff and it doesn't work, right? Yes. There's overproduction right so you make excel what's that you make it you build excel <laughs> yeah actually it's, it's almost worse than that worse than building excel <laughs> how could it be <laughs> i say that from the perspective of overproduction is like you tell me you want x and I, I think that you want X, Y, and Z, and you'll be happy for it. So I give you X, Y, and Z. But you only want X. You're only going to use X, right? Mm -hmm. So I produce way too much. More stuff than you need, right? Um, waiting. So waiting, I produce stuff, but you don't need it yet. So it just sits there. Now, I probably told you to hurry up and build it. And then I don't use yes. it, right? That never yeah. happens on our project, right? <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> not utilizing talent, right? So I actually say, hey, look, um, I really want, I really want this, uh, and it's what I, I, this happens on our project, right? I really want the, the automated test to be really, really good, right? So 
what I'm going to do, because I want it to be really good, and Jacob, you're really good as a developer, right? I'm going to assign you the responsibility of producing the automated tasks. Now, we're using Cypress, and Cypress makes things really easy, and anyone mm -hmm. can do it, right? Yes. So I got, I got an intern that can use Cypress, and, and the intern makes 25 bucks an hour, but I want it to be perfect. So I'm not going to use the intern. I'm going to use Jacob. Now, now Jacob could develop the code for the space shuttle, <laughs> but I really yeah. care. About, I really care about making sure the automated tests were good. So I'm going to have assign that to Jacob. That's that's not utilizing your talent, right? No. Yeah. Okay. Good. I'm down with uh, using the intern. <laughs> um. Trans transportation. Right. So lots of times, you know, I produce stuff and then I put it somewhere where other people don't actually go there. So they have to like travel to use it. So I want this code to be used, but I'm putting this repository over here that no one even knows about, no one even uses. It's not in the pipeline. And so you gotta go through all this extra effort to make use of it. Okay. All right, so the next one is inventory excess, right? So I think I'm going to use do some stuff in the future, even though I'm not using it now. I build it up and have you work on this stuff, even though we're not releasing it. So there's there's several features that we're working on that customer our, our stakeholders want, and in order to keep you all busy, I'm going to assign different people to work on all these different features separately. Mm -hmm. Even though I'm not releasing any of them because none of them are finished. <laughs> and some of the fe some of the stuff you're working on is dependent upon something someone else is working on. So there's dependencies, right? But again, we're all building up all this functionality no, and you may have finished first. So the functionality you, you created can't be used because the other part isn't done. That's building up inventory to access. Um, uh, th this next one is, is motion ways, right? Um, and this is when I have, I, I built, I build stuff in a way that isn't streamlining and doesn't make use of everything that's necessary. So a good example of this for, I'm gonna go back to our project, a real example is the data team, they produce um, a new report and that report needs to be displayed on our existing web page. Mm -hmm. And motion ways is they produce it, but they produce the report in like in Power BI and didn't actually have it in an embedded page. So then when you grab it to actually put it on the website, you have to go through all these extra motions to actually get it to display on our website. Mm -hmm. That's motion ways. Okay. And then the last, the eighth one is excess processing. So this occurs um, when, you know, I've, I've, in order to get something accomplished, you have to do all these other things. Then just say, let's just say hypothetically that there's someone in charge of, of, of determining the architecture. And even though you know more about developing the API in Python, Let's just say, for instance, you know, for giggles, that you had to get everything approved by some other person who's not an expert in Python. So instead of just that coding, never, that would never happen. <laughs> never happen, right? Yeah. <laughs> instead of just coding it, you got to go to somebody else and get a sign off and an approval, communicate all this other stuff, right? 
as excess processing. Now, uh -huh. now agile is goes under the premise that all these wastes are terrible, but the biggest waste, the most evil one, is producing all the extra features in Excel that no one's going to use over production. Uh -huh. And so Agile is all designed to actually say, talk to your customer, ask them what they want, just build that part. And you negotiate that until the value isn't there anymore. Then do something different. So that's the, let's see. So Excel is the worst thing ever, you're saying. <laughs> I'm going to bash Excel, right? But the, the concept of producing all these additional features that people don't want, because if you're producing features that people don't want, that means you aren't spending the time producing features that people do want. I'm wondering if it's like false humility, though, like because like Excel, I mean, it's great and all. It's not that great. Like everyone says, oh, I'm only like 5% of Excel. Like, how much like and then there's like what you could do in excel and what like you really should do in excel like like they didn't like they didn't work so hard on all the features like not all features in excel are created equally right so and like they yeah everyone's arm to use it, right? what they aren't twisting they everyone's arm and making them use it yeah no not at all not at all but that's uh-huh I feel like it, it, it's, is it, I feel like it could be that part of it is like a marketing versus the same way scrum, right? Is really a terrible ideology, but everyone likes because of marketing. Uh, so I'm uh, saying uh, Microsoft also like, yeah, like I feel like a lot of those features, like they just like, it's marketing. It's like, yeah, like, um, yeah, you want to do this in Excel, you can do this in Excel. You want to do that in Excel, you can do that in Excel. Like, it's a consumer product. It's not like a, no one like a commissioned Microsoft to make Excel, right? Yeah, and, 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 and for the record, I, I think that both Scrum and Excel are good products, right? But yes, yes. I do agree that the marketing for those products makes the reach bigger than what it probably should be. Right, it's not the best thing since sliced bread, uh -huh. um, but and the marketing has made it such. And I, I think, and I think you're right. Like a lot of it is, you know, in order to sell a product, a lot of companies will actually develop features that they know the customers aren't going to use, but they're good attention grabbers. It sounds cool, so they they'll Lame build it. it. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, Lambda is a great example. Most people get Excel because they don't want to program. Yes. Right? They, they don't want to do that hard work. So how useful is it to actually build all these like programming functionality in here? Right? I don't know. I, I so think Lambda that... Lambda is made for me, like the person who doesn't want to open Excel at all, but has to. And when, I, and when I'm opening it, the last thing I want to do is figure out what it, how Excel wants me to do something. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I would argue that there might be different tools that you may want to use instead of Excel in yes. those circumstances. Right. Well, no, but I had say they like sometimes like it's like, okay, here, here's 24 Excel sheets. So like, you know, so uh, like, yeah. So what I usually do is I like, you know, do pandas, read Excel, blah, blah, blah. But like, if you just want to open it and like see what they're doing, you know, so like, yeah, that's, that's, that's what it's for. And again, like, you know, I might say, Give it to me in a CSV format, or maybe I convert it to a CSV format. And once I do that, because all I really want is the data, I can do what the heck I want with it at that point. <laughs> no. I, I'm not saying it's a super useful feature. I'm saying, you know, <laughs> I'm, not, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying the juice is worth the squeeze, you know? <laughs> 
yeah you, you get my point right like it's you know again this so my we, my my father he used to do executive management consulting mm -hmm. and they had they had such a term milking a mouse yes that's what they used to call it yeah, um, i currently do executive management consulting and i still uh -huh. use that term. <laughs> oh they still they still use it it's still cool uh -huh. yeah uh -huh. you go to the well to the well runs dry <laughs> yes they had uh he, he worked for this company uh i don't know if you like so he worked for two of them one was Boo, booze allen, allen and, yeah and one was ba bain and company so yes. so at booze allen so so he is of the opinion that B bain and company is like miles and miles and miles more of a classy operation than booze allen was i would definitely agree so yeah, so he's saying that like in booze, like one of the things that Bain has is like they won't like they won't like discuss like like they won't talk to you unless you're an actual executive management person. Right. Whereas apparently like Booze Allen, like he had a job, like so he where he he actually quit over this, where they basically um some like regional thing of some steel company in like the 1990s wanted to like this they, they're hiring booze allen to like figure out like while steel is like going through the floor like you know the best thing to, for a steel company to do would be to get out of steel like it's a, how what's the best way to expand their steel operations and like booze allen like took the money and was like listen like well like you know we'll you know I'm, they're not asking us whether or not they should get out of steel they're asking us what the best way to expand steel operations is so that's what we'll, that's what we'll tell them right yeah it, there's a lot of that you know it and stuff that is unnecessary right so what it's, form of waste is that uh auto corruption or what <laughs> no I, I will put that into the uh this category of overproduction right you're, you're you're doing things that you know again customers are not ready for or do not need you know so even though they ask for it producing something they don't need, even despite the fact they asked for it, it's still wasteful, right? It's overproduction. Yeah. So he's telling the, 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 he's claiming the incentive structure is such that like, if you're a regional manager, like, yeah, you're get your incentives are based on how much your steel thing is producing, you know? So right. that's why, that's why you're hiring Bruce Allen. To, <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and here's the, the danger that comes in to play is that we and this goes back to the uh you know the agile manifesto we, we looked at earlier we still look at things so focused on the process and right now the current process in, in hr is to reward individuals by their individual performance and often that's not the best way to do it, right? Often we should be rewarding people for the collective, the collaborative performance, right? So we have an organizational goal and I should reward them for how good the organization did. And then you wouldn't actually have people actually doing things for their individual benefit that don't benefit the organization overall see this is this is okay so this is again where i'm saying where where i have to say that the the whole agile like approach of like you know theory x versus theory y like you know people are evil or people are people like is there like a theory z people are just stupid is whatever and like yeah hr will never get anything right so why bother <laughs> there is a theory z but it's not what you think it is. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. <laughs> so theory Z, um, what you'll actually see here, is basically this philosophy um, that people people actually do things individually individually. Right. But they 
there's an in-depth desire to want to work for the greater good. In theory Z, as she set forth, you can see here, there's a set of assumptions about human behavior that clashes in several ways with how organizational behavior is traditionally perceived in the US. Right? In the US, we act as though everyone works out of their own self-interest. And theory Z is like, no, people actually want to do what's good for the group. Right? Okay, so what's theory stupid? Like, where is that? Like, what no, what letter is that? Because that's the one I'm going. <laughs> but I, I think theory stupid is is is, is X, right? Uh, that we're just lazy and blah blah blah. Because look, if not all people are lazy and and don't want to do stuff, and and if you hire everyone, them, you're what stupid. About the, what about <laughs> the fact that HR is a self-selecting group of rent-seeking uh, vermin? <laughs> so I think that. Um, th this is the interesting. So here's here's the, the levy theory for all this stuff. You ready for this? Okay. The levy theory is that the systems that we have in play are actually established to keep people operating in a way that's super inefficient. So right now, or right now you're in a position where you have a person who's like a manager who you report to that a person, person who's a manager who I report to right How about three people who are who <laughs> who don't who one of them knows uh, about as much uh, about programming as I know about about on motorcycle mechanics uh, you know machinism and you know one of the yeah whatever um, yeah, yeah no I don't I, three people the, 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 the modern workplace is like that, where like you report to people. Again, I talked about, I started this conversation off talking about knowledge workers. All right, software, right. IT people, they're knowledge workers. Knowledge workers know more than their bosses about the things that they do. But this, the systems we have in place are all set up such that the person who manages you gives you your performance evaluation, they give you feedback. And based on that feedback, they determine your compensation, your bonuses, mm -hmm. right? They determine your raises. But it, it's that's stupid. They're the least qualified to be able to evaluate you, right? They, the, the other coders on the team, they're way more qualified to evaluate you, right? Mm -hmm. And Really, I would rather, instead of actually, since the evaluations are coming from management and they're poor at doing it, the worst case scenario is what, what you're in, where your compensation is determined by that evaluation. Okay. But I would, ha I would have to, like, I'd have to be, like, I'd have to, like, really be pissed off, like, at, like, someone's incompetence to give them like less than like a four out of five stars you know to be fair <laughs> like there's a certain there's a certain thing in that uh, management mentality that you know that like uh, allows for you know like you don't want to give people give be giving people bonuses and stuff and you know having workplace uh, satisfaction like what what would people think well i i think bonuses are okay but i will point out if you look at the 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 data on the subject of bonuses, what we found is that people actually perform worse when they know that their compensation is tied to their performance. Mm -hmm. So we yeah. we think that they perform better, okay. but but we know that they study, perform study worse. Study has shown they do worse under pressure. But we think in what we know, right? So, yeah, we think we know, so we keep doing it. Yeah. The, the system is actually bad. Like, and for a lot of clients, I've actually changed the system where you don't get rewarded. Um, well, you don't get evaluated by your boss. You get evaluated mm -hmm. by your team. And I, I've okay. switched it so that you don't get a performance bonus. It's like, hey, if I'm worth this much, I'm doing this work. Let's not play a guessing game and all that kind of stuff. Just give me a salary worth that much, right? And if I don't perform, fire me, right? 
but mm -hmm. let's, not, let's not put that pressure on me where I have to think about how you're going to perceive things. Because when you do, when I'm in a situation where I know that my compensation is tied to your perception of how I'm doing, then if I know that I should use this design pattern and code things this way, and it'll turn out better. But I think that you don't believe that. Instead of me choosing the best thing for the company and the design um, pattern is optimal, I will choose the design pattern that I know that you consider it acceptable, even though it's gonna hurt the company because that's what gets me a bigger bonus. Does that make sense? Yes. And, and that's what we do, right? No, no like, for sure, yeah. You know. we, we make these choices that are suboptimal for the company. Oh, I make like three or four suboptimal choices a day, you know. Because <laughs> someone's with full, with, with full knowledge, they're suboptimal, but you know. Right. You gotta, gotta play the game, man. <laughs> yeah, so I, yeah I, my perception is that those type systems that exist are evil and we should be changing the way that we do performance management. Yeah. But I feel I feel like the people who are doing it are rent seekers who who like like this is this is not set up by accident, I don't think. I think this is set up because like if somebody is if somebody is like, oh I set all the standards and if you don't and if you don't uh, like, you know, keep the, uh, if you don't keep, you know, like, and like everything has to go through me, right? Then like, <laughs> yeah, like, and then, and then like, okay, then like, if they leave, like, oh, suddenly nothing is going forward. Oh, this person is pushing things forward. Like, no, this person is a dam that is, that is stationed there. And his, he's, he's the toll person and he just put the toll down and like, He's just left and is not, he's just stopped lifting the toll, you know, like, so, you know, like, I, I think like this, I think there's like a, you seem to, you seem to be a lot more generous in your, in your, I, I happen to think like this, this is actually, there's actually a reason for this, for this, like, it's not like you could just like point this out to people who are like, oh, okay, well then, then I won't have to, then yeah, I'll just, I'll just add value instead of, you know, being a, being a rent seeker, you know, like, sure. Good point. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Brian. <laughs> I, I am a little bit more generous than you. Um, I I fully believe that this current systems that are in place are based in the theories of Frederick Taylor and his principles of scientific uh, management that were actually established in well, like anyone, 1911. If there's anything to say. Listen, anything that says scientific in the title, I just immediately dismiss as being terrible. <laughs> and, you know, basically, um, I pulled up some of the stuff from uh, Frederick Taylor's stuff. Um, again, he believed that one must examine the job or the task, determine the best way to do it, and then choose the most appropriate person for that task. Um, it says, while at the same time providing proper compensation. So in 1911, Frederick Taylor said, hey, management is so, the smartest at figuring out what tasks need to be done. Okay, but like, uh, <laughs> what, when, the problem with this is it's either, it's either wrong or trivially true. Like, like, the, like, yes, when you need something done, first you need to see what needs to be done. And that like, meaning... Like uh, you need to trust management to not hire plumbers to write software, you know? <laughs> well, I, I think it's slightly different. I, in 1911, I think that mo most people were actually in factories working mm -hmm. or on a farm. And I think that in, th in that time period, managers did no more than their average employee about what tasks need to be done and how it need to be done. And so it made sense to do this. But now that we're in the 21st century and we got knowledge workers, I, I think that you know more about how to code in Python than the person you report to. And you're better yeah. at figuring out the tasks. 
not them. Well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to fight with you on that one, but, uh, but it's like that for most knowledge work. Like I was talking to my mother-in-law this weekend and she's describing how, you know, she's a, she's a lawyer and she's describing how the law that she practices, she knows more about it than the person she reports to. I talked to my wife, who's a doctor, right? And she knows more about, you know, the anesthesia and applying it than the person she, she reports to. Like the, any knowledge work, again, what signifies knowledge work is that the people doing it know more than- does she, does she report to an anesthesiologist or like uh, to a general no, you doctor? never do. You, you report to someone who most times, and here's the deal, with all knowledge work, most times you don't report to a practitioner, right? Ooh. Maybe that person used to practice. Oh, oh you report to some, some rent seeker. Exactly. <laughs> right, okay, you report but, to an administrator. Yeah, but you see, you see, you see, you see like, but you, but you don't believe that there's a reason why those administrators are there, and it's because they found a sweet, a sweet hot of honey, pot of honey they could suck dry. No, so uh, here's what I believe in. I, I believe again these principles I'm showing you is basically how HR runs now. This was set up in the early 1900s, so we've been applying these principles. Now this came out in 1913. We've continued to follow these principles and operate in this manner, even though the times have changed. Okay, but so did Frederick Taylor ever, well, first of all, it's scientific, so it doesn't make a difference. It's just general principles that would apply to any set of axiom axioms, right? That's what right. scientific means, don't you know what scientific? No, but also like, I don't know, like how many, like you have to, you happen to be uh, well versed in 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 the works of of management and stuff, and like you know efficiency. But like most people are just like, oh, like I get a job as an administrator. Like, oh, what do I have to do? Oh, cast judgment on 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 con competent people and and determine whether or not they're good. Oh yeah, sure, that seems like a sweet gig. Like, yeah. you know, I you, pay you know, more to crush their spirit. You know, you, <laughs> You don't think you don't think like that's a little more likely than them having read uh, obscure 1913 author. I, I'm not actually promoting that they operate because they've read Frederick Taylor. What I what I'm advocating is that long ago management was set up this way, and everyone else has been practicing management the same way it's been practiced because the person before them did it, and that's what they saw, even though it may not be appropriate for the situation that they ran. Okay. I'm doing it because the person that I learned from did it this way, right? Okay, but like, um, you don't think that like, cause like I've actually like heard people say like, I, I mean like, I think maybe the difference is I've actually heard people say this to me. Like I have a sweet gig, like what I do is like, Doctors go like spend like ten years, like like I mean I, I'm I'm abstracting it to the doctor thing, but yeah. like ten years studying their trade and what I do is I sort of like uh, I just like look over their shoulder and like yeah my job is like to see if like they're like uh, they screwed up. <laughs> you know I don't like know what to do anything but like yeah it's a good job. Yeah. You know, like, and I get paid, I, you know, as comparable to the doctor. <laughs> yeah, so I, I do think that happens, but people take advantage of a system that's already in existence. But I, I think that most people don't go about creating that system. Uh, you're saying, you're saying like nobody would have like, nobody would have been able to, to convince the like actual people running hospitals to like, to have administrative, I don't know, but I mean, like, right. I feel like colleges, like, you know, like colleges have like more administrators now than teachers than like professors. Oh yeah. <laughs> like so, somebody like Wrong somebody, that, right? no, like somebody obviously like was an evil genius who, who was like, oh, let's just like, this is like a, a, this is a, these, 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 uh, 
institutes of higher learning are of like billion dollar endowments. This is a great thing to leech off of, though. Like this is not, you don't think that happened ever? I I think that um again, I was telling you that some a lot of the stuff we do is based off of the work of uh of Locke and Latham mm -hmm. and goal setting theory. And what they actually figured out is that if you can get everyone to agree to the goal, the people that are accountable for reaching the results will naturally collaborate to figure out the best way to reach the results. But because we've never, we haven't practiced management that way, in our mm -hmm. mind, the current way we practice management is we think that there has to be a boss, a person in charge who they know the goal and make the people that report to them work to achieve it that people won't do it okay part, part of part of it is hipaa is like not hipaa is like and uh, you know that was my example but like government like government is like only knows how to be top down and they make requirements on private companies right like half of those administrators like the the the, the if the hospital fired them they'd lose uh whatever it is that hospitals have to be licensed to be hospitals well i i don't think so so let me give the example in our organization. So in, in our company, in our organization, you know, we set up Scrum. And I talked to everybody and I said, you know what? There's three roles in Scrum. There is a Scrum master, there's a product owner, and then there's a team member. And everyone fills one of those roles. And no one has to be in charge. Like we're all working as a team. So the scrum master isn't in charge of the team, neither is the product owner. We just do different roles and we should be collaborating and working together. But when I actually talked to our group, they were dead set on the paradigm of somebody being in charge. Who's they? And no one asked me. <laughs> When I talked to uh, your management, right? They, they wanted to manage. Wow, shocking. <laughs> you could blow me out over the spoon. <laughs> Not only did they want to be wanted to manage, they wanted to be the product owner because they're like, in their minds, they're like, oh, well, the product owner seems to have most of the power so they can tell everybody what to do. So I want that. I want to be in charge. <laughs> I want to be equal. <laughs> uh -huh. Right? It, it's just a it's a paradigm that you know way of thinking that doesn't need to be that way it's it's not optimal right yeah but but, make but you but you realize that like okay so like i'll give you an example like mm -hmm. the person in charge gets gets an office the person who's not in charge gets a cubicle the person in charge gets a higher salary versus not just so we can justify giving our like you know spending all this month time and money on ourselves because we're the ones making decisions. Yeah, and that's what needs to stop, right? I mean, if, if we could agree to just be equal and not give the person in charge the office versus the cubicle, and not give the person in charge more compensation, then you wouldn't actually need to have a person in charge, right? We, yeah so i feel like i feel like that is uh, that gives them all of the incentives of the world to keep it the way it is like not because right. they read friedrich taylor's scientific management system just because like they're be they're beneficiaries of being in charge i agree a hundred percent and and that's why this these frederick taylor systems have persisted over the ages for just what you said we've set up systems that reward people for being in charge, even if they make suboptimal decisions and it hurts the organization, we create an incentives for it. So the person in charge wants to keep that system in place so they can keep getting the extra incentives. They benefit from it. And if we want things to get better, you got to destroy the whole system, right? The, the way we do performance management right now is downright evil. And unless we destroy the system itself, 
you're not going to get the optimal performance. You'll get what we get right now, which is very suboptimal. Right. Uh huh. So, so yeah. So I, I I'm let's let's so let's wrap this up on a less less up, less. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get an uplifting. Sad, sad note. <laughs> Depressed know. our audience. You all yes. have jury jobs <laughs> under the thumb of the management overlord taskmasters. <laughs> you can add child and scrum happy. all you want. <laughs> be happy about it. <laughs> you're, you're still going to be a slave. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I think getting back to our, our initial. Uh, our initial focus on the, the, the history of Agile, I, I think that, again, but Agile was based on this history of, you know, even though they wanted to have a methodology, that one, one ring to rule them all, uh, that perfect yes. methodology, but they discovered, and this is interesting, Agile was initially called lightweight, because what they found out is that, when, as they were discussing this stuff, is that the other methodologies that were process centric had so many processes and so many things to do that it felt heavy, heavyweight. So mm -hmm. called it lightweight and then lightweight wasn't a great name for marketing purposes. And they just given the picture the, from the agile sells better, right? Uh -huh. um, Say so lightweight sounds like it's like uh, meh. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh -huh. So uh, again, I, I think that Agile has made a progression, and the cool thing is that although it was started in software development, it's pivoted and actually used more outside of software development. So even though it's widespread, it's a de facto way to go in software development, but its applications have spread out to all product development. So manufacturers. Um, you know, I, teachers, one of the most widespread uses is in education, right? Hmm. Um, I don't know if you ever heard of, of National Public Radio, NPR. They use Scrum to produce their newscasts, right? Uh -huh. um, so the, the applications, you know, it's grown because people- I mean, it is, it is, it is really not very popular. <laughs> the, the, I think, I think, I, I grew up look, hear, hearing them referred to as National Palestinian Radio. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it depends on your political leanings, right? Yes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, again, there's these widespread uses. Um, you know, my I certified my wife in Agile, um, and she uses it at the hospital, right? Uh huh. And we're learning that the whole group dynamics, shared goals, is a better paradigm to work with then yeah, so, we... so okay this is this is actually fascinating we should have gotten here sooner next time <laughs> let's talk about like yeah like uh cross but like i yeah to me like it just seems totally uh yeah totally novel that somebody could use uh, agile to like you know put someone to sleep yeah I mean, obviously talking about Agile, we do it all the time, but you know. My, my wife has complained about that several times. <laughs> yes, like it's stealing, you're stealing her market share. <laughs> <laughs> and me and my friends have put her to sleep talking about it, but um, yeah, yeah. Why don't, we, uh, why don't we wrap this broadcast up and then next, maybe the next broadcast, we'll talk about applications of Agile outside of IT. Cool, let's do it. You got it. All right. Thanks, audience. We'll do this again. Yes. See you next time on Agile Adventures. Do, do, do.